Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is president of Eurasia Group, Ian Bremmer. Ian, thanks so much for coming on once again. Hi, my pleasure. We're at a real crossroads right now, and you recently delivered your 2024 State of the World speech, where you talk about where we are now and where we are going, both domestically and internationally. So let's first start at home, where we sit right now a week out from Election Day. How different will both the United States and the world look under a Harris presidency versus a Trump one? Pretty, pretty dramatically different. Uh, I mean, there's no question these are two uh, candidates with very different world views. Uh, and there, I would say, first of all, we want to look at a place like Russia, Ukraine. Uh, Trump is much more of a unilateralist. So he wants to end the war. Uh, so does Kamala. But his way of ending the war would be calling Zelensky and Putin individually saying, that's it. No more fighting. Cease fire where we are. Otherwise, I'm going to cut off your aid, Ukraine. Otherwise, I'm going to sanction you a lot uh, more strongly. Uh, Kamala Harris would be a much more multilateralist. She would coordinate with the allies in Europe, common NATO position, bring the Ukrainians on board, and try to have a negotiating position with Russia collectively with the allies in Ukraine. So very different way of trying to bring the war to an end. <coughs> on the Middle East, um, the uh, Biden has been extremely pro-Israel. Uh, Trump, arguably even a little more so in the sense that he would be actively supportive of Israel expanding um, its war um, into Iran to remove Iran's nuclear capabilities and might be willing to help the Israelis with that. Um, he no longer supports a two-state solution, though he did back when he was president the first time around. Kamala Harris would certainly still be very strongly pro-Israel, uh, but more interested in ensuring that the Palestinians have humanitarian aid that's adequate, something Trump doesn't really care about, and also proactively pushing a two-state solution. So different, definitely, between the two. And then finally, on China, the other big issue out there, uh, a Trump administration much more focused on higher tariffs, uh, has talked about 60% tariffs on all Chinese exports across the board, something the Chinese are very scared of, especially given that their economy is not doing very well right now could lead to a deal, but also could easily lead to major escalation between the two countries, where a Harris administration would be very, very similar to what we've seen from Biden. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan just was in Beijing a couple weeks ago, spent a couple of days with the foreign minister and then the president uh, to help ensure that a transition, if Harris wins, is smooth, something that the Chinese government appreciated. So those are, I think, the big differences on the top issues out there lot of geopolitical movements right now. So let's start with the one you started with first, the Russia-Ukraine war. Obviously, Ukraine has been at war with Russia since Russia invaded in February of 2022. Let's say Harris becomes president. There's that more multilateral approach like you talked about. Would that end the conflict faster than if Trump was president and there was that more isolated approach? Um, it's quite possible that Trump's approach would end the war more quickly but it might not end the war in a more stable way. I mean, first, the fact that Ukraine wouldn't have any hard security guarantees, at least not from the Americans, and certainly wouldn't be joining NATO, means that longer term, Russia's ability to rearm, rebuild, and have another bite at that apple becomes more uh, likely than in a multilateral approach um, where all of NATO is together with the Ukrainians in a negotiating position. So perhaps more likely that it ends the war quickly, but, but less likely that it's sustainable long term. Um, by the way, Trump's Afghanistan deal with the Taliban got the war over faster than you otherwise would have expected. The outcome long term was less stable, right? So it's, it's a kind of a question to be careful what you wish for. So when you're saying be careful what you wish for, do you think the world as a whole, our allies, are wishing for a Harris presidency because that would end that conflict in a much more stable way? Um, I think that uh, it is not easy to say everybody wants one thing. There are certainly some allies 
that would prefer um, a Trump administration. Israel would prefer a Trump administration. Um, I think um, it's possible that Turkey would prefer a Trump administration. Um, and uh, India doesn't care. They're happy either way. I would say most other allies would prefer a Harris administration. Almost all of the Europeans, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and South Korea pretty clearly would prefer Harris. And some of that is because um, Harris cares more about allies. Harris cares more about multilateralism. I mean, a self-described America first policy of Trump is, let's face it, not exactly intended to make allies feel like they're going to be valued or treated well. Um, and I, I think that that has, you know, in a sense, undermined his brand with a lot of these countries and a lot of their experience dealing with him uh, in the first term was challenged in that way. What do you think that America first stance and approach really does to the United States? Where does that put us on the global stage? And where will that put us in four years from now, say he is president? Um, well, the United States is in a much stronger power position, even vis-a-vis -vis its allies, than it was 10 years ago. I mean, Europe in many ways is getting weaker. America is getting stronger. The US today is producing more fossil fuels than any other country in the world, oil and gas, right? Uh, the US is a global leader, the global leader in artificial intelligence, the most important constellation of technologies in the world today, affecting every sector, every country. The US is dominating it in the private sector. US still has the global reserve currency, about the same percentage of global trade as it was back in the 1990s. The Euro has slipped, the yen has slipped. So, you know, in an America first Trump presidency, you're still gonna have that power position. What you're not going to have is leading by example. So to the extent that soft power matters, to the extent that you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar, um, there are um, challenges in a Trump administration getting it what it wants from other countries. In other words, countries will do what Trump wants if they feel like they must, uh, but otherwise uh, they won't. It'll be more transactional. And, and Trump is fine with that, but long-term that erodes the international system. Long-term, the international system benefits the country that set the rules and benefits the country that's the largest in it. And that's something that frankly, uh, Trump really, in my view, doesn't appreciate, doesn't care about. I, wa I want to move now to Israel and read something that you said in your speech. You said this, the United States has abdicated its responsibility in the Middle East. It is by far the most important friend in the world of Israel, and it has used none of its political influence to bring that conflict to an end. So what do you think the United States should do and how do you think it could course correct maybe between now and the next president? Well, I'll use Ukraine as an example. I mean, here we have a Russian invasion of Ukraine. It was horrific. And the, the United States led by creating a coalition of countries around the world to ensure that we had a policy together to allow Ukraine to defend itself, to rebuild, um, and to get their territory back, and also to punish the Russians, to freeze their assets, to sanction them, to, to let others in the, in the, around the world know this kind of behavior would not be rewarded and it would be stupid for them to try the same thing. So I, I would have taken a page out of that successful book. The U.S. is the most powerful country in the world, whether it's on Russia, Ukraine or whether it's Israel, Palestine. When we had that horrific terrorist attack on October 7th, the worst loss of life um, of any Jews being targeted in the world since the Holocaust, the right thing for the U.S. to do would have been to create a coalition bring countries together to say this will not be tolerated. And that fight with Israel together would have been much more targeted, much more effective, could have had the Gulf states on board too. A lot of, there was much more outpouring of support for Israel at that point. Wouldn't have been very supportive of the Israeli prime minister because of course he was asleep at the switch and causing a lot of the problems that had occurred in Israel in the run up to these attacks. Um, but, but also would have been much more concerned about civilian deaths, much more in ensuring that the Palestinians 
um, were able to have humanitarian support than the Israelis would have been operating by themselves. So I, I think that um, a America leading a coalition approach would have been a vastly better way to go. I know how optimistic this question is going to sound, so please keep that in mind. But is there a way where there is go we could see long term stabilization in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians? And how what part would the United States play in getting there? Um, I think that we're likely to see frozen instability for a while, which will feel like stability because things aren't moving. Uh, I mean, the war is going to be over in Gaza. I, I expect that, and I don't think we need a ceasefire for that. I think the Israelis will unilaterally announce an end to major military operations, and they'll do it because they've killed the leadership, they've blown up the tunnels, and they've taken out the weapons depots. So, I mean, it's not like there's a lot of additional targets for the Israelis to hit. Um, but that doesn't give the Palestinians a state. That doesn't give them the ability to rebuild their, their territory, their infrastructure, create livelihoods. And I think we're a long, long way from that. Um, the, at this point, you're hard pressed to find Palestinians in Gaza and even in the West Bank who think that Israel have a right to exist um, as a Jewish state after what we've seen in the last year. And there are a lot of Israelis, uh, most Israelis no longer believe the Palestinians deserve a state. So, I mean, what's happened uh, from October 7th and in the year since is a radicalization, a further radicalization of both populations farther away from um, what would be the, the, the a true stability. So frozen instability, sure. Creation of conditions for long term stability, I think we're farther from that than we were when the war started. And who do you think is more equipped to create the long-term stability, a Trump presidency or a Harris one? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, you know, a Trump presidency is much more likely to work closely with the Gulf states um, to try to rebuild Gaza. Remember, when Trump was president first time around, his first trip as president was to Saudi Arabia. And then he went to Israel. And then he went to the Vatican, right? I mean, it was like not what we normally see from a president. Canada is usually the first trip, right? Um, and he's very comfortable uh, with the leaders of the Gulf states. He also is very comfortable with removing the Palestinians from Gaza. I think he'd put a lot of pressure on um, to get the Palestinians to the Negev, for example, in Egypt, and just have them be long-term refugees um, in camps. Um, and that's not an acceptable outcome for the Palestinians. But, you know, the Palestinians are obviously the losers of this conflict. Um, and the question is, you know, who's going to take care of them when they're no longer in the headlines and the fighting isn't happening? Historically, the answer has been nobody. My fear would be that is going to happen again. So it, it's possible that um, you would have a faster move towards rebuilding of Gaza um, under Trump. Again, the question is, are you taking a short term win for longer term instability? Right. I mean, it's the same mm -hmm. question is coming up over and over again on what a Trump administration is likely to mean globally compared to Kamala Harris. Now let's move on to China because when Kamala Harris was asked, who do you think the United States' biggest adversary is? She said Iran. Donald Trump said he thinks the enemy from within sometimes is a bigger threat than Russia, from China. Some national security experts would say that China is our biggest adversary. What do you think the United States' relationship with China looks like in a couple of months, whether it be a Trump presidency or a Harris one? Uh, in, a, in a Trump presidency, uh, the big issue is, are you going to put major tariffs on? He's not as focused on Taiwan, though Congress is. Certainly Republicans in Congress are. Um, and he's not as focused on technology, semiconductors, AI. He's very focused on the trade deficit. And the only part of China's economy that is succeeding right now is their manufacturing sector. There's not much domestic demand for it. It is overproduction and being sent around the world to the United States and other countries. So yeah, Trump has a reason to be angry about the trade deficit. And I mean, you know, he doesn't want to put a VAT uh, on American goods, but I mean, you can do effectively the same thing by throwing a massive tariff on China. 
Now, um, if it's that big, if it's 60% is a real number, then the cost on, on the American consumer and on China is going to be massive. And, and that could lead to a trade war between the two countries. Or it could lead the Chinese to cry uncle and say, I've got to give this guy a deal because I can't afford this. So I would say with Trump, there are tail risks, both upside and downside, that are much more significant on China than the status quo ante that we would see continuing uh, if Harris were to be president. And what a potential trade war. How badly would that hurt the United States? Uh, less badly than it would hurt China, certainly. Um, but, you know, it would have an impact on, on consumer goods. I mean, I think that the major issue uh, for a Trump presidency economically is that it's inflationary. It's inflationary because of tariffs and it's inflationary because of his views of illegal immigration. I mean, he says he wants to remove 12 million illegal immigrants from the United States. I think that is impossible from an infrastructure perspective, but it's certainly plausible he could do 1.5 million to maybe 5 million. And those are people you are taking out of the labor market um, and the cost of labor will go up. You still need those jobs to be done. It's relatively tight in terms of unemployment right now. So people gonna have to pay a lot more. And who are they gonna pass those, those costs on to? Consumers. So uh, in both cases, a Trump presidency would be significantly inflationary. I want to talk about the part of your speech where you were talking about uh, the United States and the conflict we see domestically, and you called that the war between Americans and Americans. Can you explain that and expand on that just a little bit? Um, I think that whoever we vote for in the United States on Tuesday, um, it's not that the enemy is within, it's rather that people think that the enemy is within. Both sides, Democrats and Republicans, believe that the other side of the political spectrum wants to destroy democracy. I mean, they're calling each other fascists. Um, you know, they're talking about the deep state. They're talking about, you know, each other's a dictator. Um, and I mean, to, I'll put my cards on the table. I mean, I personally believe that Trump in particular is the most unfit for office person that we have ever experienced as president and shouldn't be allowed to run. But unfortunately, impeachment, which used to be a check on the executive authority in the United States, no longer functions as part of our institutional framework. So democracy has eroded and Trump has taken advantage of that. Um, but the broader problem is not Trump. Trump is a symptom of the broader problem. The broader problem is that you have lots of Americans that don't believe that the country works as an effective democracy anymore, but they don't believe that their leaders represent them. Um, and, and that is what's driving this, you know, us versus them, um, America versus itself, uh, warfare, uh, political warfare that is going on now. And, and is one of the reasons why the US is the only country among all advanced industrial democracies is not capable of having a free and fair election that is seen as legitimate by its entire population. Canada can, the UK, even Italy, France, Japan, South Korea, they can all do it. Even poorer countries like Indonesia had 140 million people vote in one day. No problem. Transition. We can't do it in the United States. That's a serious problem. I mean, that's really alarming. So how dangerous do you think this time is right now? Do you think democracy is hanging by a thread like some people think? Are we at the point of no return? What does that look like? Well, democracy is not in crisis around the world. It's in crisis in the United States, first of all. So this is a more uniquely American problem. Secondly, it's not hanging by a thread. Part of the reason why this is happening is because the U.S. is so wealthy and its institutions are so resilient that a lot of short-term oriented, ambitious, uh, greedy people are happy to take care of themselves and with no concern about the long-term implications of the country. If it was a more urgent crisis, they would be taking it perhaps more seriously. I mean, January 6th um, wasn't a big enough deal to force the Republicans to move against Trump, for example. I mean, you know, uh, one person was killed but I mean, no members of Congress, no one in the House, not that no one in the Senate, not Mike Pence. I mean, it wasn't a it wasn't a violent enough. It wasn't didn't shake people enough to make them think, OK, we've got to get rid of this guy, Trump. 
Um, and so they went back to, well, Biden's going to be president and we want to keep our jobs. And so we don't need to be brave. We don't need to be courageous. We don't need to stand for our values. We see what happens when Liz Cheney does that. She gets drummed out of the party. So you need a bigger crisis to force the Americans um, to actually become to take on leadership. And uh, I, I do suspect a bigger crisis is coming. But no, I, I don't think that this is a moment of civil war. And I don't think the United States is about to become authoritarian. I think it's different. You called the post-election period uniquely dangerous. It has the potential of being in your speech. What does that look like? Because you're hinting at the potential for a bigger crisis. Is there a bigger January 6th that we should be looking out for after this election? What do you think? Well, I mean, if Trump had been assassinated, and I mean, we came, you didn't ask me about that. No one asked about it. It lasted for like a few days in our news cycle, basically. But I mean, it was within an instant of happening with someone who wasn't particularly skilled. Uh, I, I think that the US would have been in flames. Uh, I, I think you would have had huge numbers of people who believe, believe that they tried to impeach him illegally. They tried to arrest him illegally. They failed, they failed, and now they killed him. Who's the they? I don't know, but it's them. You know, it's the deep state. It's the Democrats. It's the, the evil forces. And they would have come out and they would have rioted with highly weaponized, right? Um, and that could have well included people in local police forces and National Guard and, you know, even some military. That would have been a very dangerous thing. Again, not a civil war, but certainly much more violent than anything we've seen since the 60s, maybe well before then. So, um, you know, we don't talk about the things that almost happen, but this just, it's the next major surprise, right? I mean, this is, this crises are waiting to happen in this environment. You've got all sorts of people weaponizing disinformation. I mean, this is why the pandemic could have been that kind of a crisis. The pandemic killed so many more people percentage wise in the US than it did in other advanced industrial democracies. Why? Because we didn't believe our doctors. We didn't believe our government officials. We decided to politicize the crisis, so more people died. Now, it turned out it wasn't that big of a crisis. Why? Because most of the people that died were really old or had pre-existing conditions. If COVID had killed a bunch of kids, or if we didn't have a, 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 a proper vaccine for it in very short order, miraculous order, that could have been the crisis that would force us to get our act together. There are plenty of crises that are coming. Uh, it's just a question of we need one that's big enough that makes a country as strong as America to get our heads out of our collective asses. You bring up a really good point. So then I guess in that getting our heads out of, you know, the ground, so to speak, where do you see us going next from this election? Or does it matter who wins? Are we at like that crossing point where we go to opposite directions? What are you looking out for in the next week or so? Because we're probably not going to figure out who wins the election come election night. I think we would be better off as a country um, if the election were decisive, no matter who wins. So, I mean, certainly, again, as someone who believes that, that Trump um, does not care about our values and institutions, I would strongly prefer for that person to be Harris or anyone that is not Trump. I mean, I, I felt that way about Trump when he was a Democrat. This has nothing to do with party affiliation, and I'm not a registered member of a party. Um, but if Trump wins, it is still much better if he wins decisively. If the Democrats have to say, you know what, he is our president. And you know what, it's not a dictatorship and he's not rounding us up and putting us in camps. And we have to find a way to work together. And there are still Democrats that are, you know, in, in they've got governorships and they've got, you know, members of Congress and they almost have, you know, 50 seats in Senate. And there's still a filibuster. And so there's still a way to work together and keep the country together. And, and if, if Harris wins, you absolutely want it to be decisive enough that even when Trump says, no, I won, I won, I won, that everyone else thinks it dismisses it as the ravings of a lunatic um, and that he is defenestrated from the party. So, I mean, you know, he's lost before, they've lost two midterms, they've lost the second presidential election under Trump. They finally say, enough, enough, this guy is, because the Republicans should win this election. It, every election in the world is a change election right now. People are not happy with the trajectory of their country. The only reason the Dems have a chance is because Trump is such an appallingly bad candidate. If they were running anyone else, the Republicans would win, right? So that, that's where we are today.
And unfortunately, the election does seem very close. It does seem on a razor's edge. All the polls are within the margin of error. So I am not likely to be right in what I hope will happen. Uh, but it would be better for the country if that's what happened. And I just want to ask one final question. Do you think, let's say, Donald Trump does lose because he lost in 2020, the midterms weren't that red wave that was predicted, do you think the Republican Party will be done once and for all with MAGA, or is that just now what the right is in this country? Uh, I don't think it'll be done with MAGA uh, in the sense that I think that there is still a lot of populism uh, on the right. There's a lot of populism on the left, too. Um, but I think they'll be done with Trump. Uh, and I think that's important. He's 78 years old and he would have lost a presidential race a second time. And, and, and a whole bunch of people that would have debased and embarrassed themselves getting fully on the Trump train, people that are powerful, right? Um, and so I, I'd like to believe that a second time and that's it for him. Um, and doesn't mean it could be J.D. Vance. Uh, it could be anybody. But I do think that Trump is uniquely unsuited um, you know, given given the criminality, uh, frankly, um, n never mind lots of the personal character flaws uh, that exist and given just how, how old uh, he is and how much mental um, uh, debility we've seen over the past months. Um, but uh, we'll see. Ian Bremer, I appreciate the conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome back anytime. My pleasure. Good talking.